Leslie doesn't really need an introduction, right? He is the creator of TLA Plus. He received, among other things, uh, the Turing Award uh, because of other things. And TLA Plus, he received the Turing Award, so you all know him. Um, we will now have like half an hour or so to have a Ask Me Anything TLA Plus session. We have six pre-submitted questions. I guess we will go through these uh, questions. And then if you think of new questions, more questions follow up, then it's fine uh, to just raise your hand again, okay? And I'm going to read out the questions here. I have to do this uh, kind of over here. So the qu first question is by Eric Pintor. He asks, what is, in your opinion, the most important lesson you've learned while modeling distributed systems in TLA plus? Uh, Damn the time, no, but I think there's something wrong with the question in that uh, I'm not going to learn things about modeling distributed systems in TLA+. Plus. Uh, I learned them by modeling distributed systems, which I've you know, been doing uh, for the past, well, since around uh, 1977 or so. And TLA+, plus just, uh, you know, is a way of uh, modeling, the, it's a way of writing down the model formally, and uh, so uh, I don't learn anything from TLA+, plus. it's just uh, I learn any you know, things from thinking about distributed systems. TLA+, plus is just the language I express it in. Okay, so let's move on to the next question by Lauren Hochstein. Why are TLA plus specs written upside down? If a, re <laughs> if a reader wants to get a top-down understanding of the spec, they have to start at the bottom and then read upwards. Uh, I must say it never occurred to me to do it any other way. Uh, the problem uh, with trying to write it the other way it would be very... I mean, it works fine for programming languages because programming languages, you know, you write recursive... Uh, definitions or recursive uh, code just naturally and you don't think about it being recursive. But, you know, when you're doing mathematics, recursion is a uh, uh, somewhat subtle thing. And don't, you know, that's why you, know, you have to explicitly have a you know, recursive declaration to let the world know that you, you're doing a recursive function. And I think it will be very unnatural. Uh, you basically have to Interpreter, the, the parser would have to basically work bottom up, and I think it would make it rather unnatural for writing uh, specs. But yeah, it, it's a nice way to read them, and that's why you can use uh, modules to do that by basically importing definitions, lower level definitions at the beginning, and then the reader can, you know, just later read the. Uh, if you look at that other module. Okay, I see the person who asked the question nodding, so I guess this means the question has been answered. So, third question here by Andrew Helver. Higher order, and now it gets technical, uh, higher order recursive functions are currently presented in TLA plus due to a SENI bug. You said they were not intended to be allowed because determining the semantics of recursive function themselves was already very difficult. Could you talk a bit about the level of rigor you require when adding features to TLA plus? What subfields of math or computer science are required to define the semantics of a TLA plus language feature? What does the process look like? Is the process accessible to someone with less mathematical, mathematical training? Well, just uh, read whatever the chapter is or the section of the specifying systems book that uh, uh, gives you the semantics of TLA plus. And uh, it's, you don't need any subtle math or anything, you know. Uh, TLA plus is based, you know, the things you need to know to understand TLA plus, you should learn in the, you know, a course on set, you know, the first, a first year course in uh, uh, college about, you know, that covers sets and, uh, and logic. Uh, and, so the level of rigor that I demand is that it be completely rigorous. That basically, if you like, you could specify the semantics in TLA plus completely. Uh, 
And if you, by the way, if you think recursion is, uh, you know, is simple, uh, read there's a paper on my publications page down near the end uh, by me and uh, Georges Gantier giving the semantics of uh, recursive function definition in TLA+. And it, it ain't easy, but it doesn't require any higher math. Okay, and I think the next question then also by Andrew kind of bridges into this. Um, if you were to develop a language standard for TLA plus version number three, so we're currently at version number two, uh, what changes would you made or would be made? You said seldom used language features like sub-expressions were a mistake that should be removed. Would labels make the cut? Would you add anything? Uh, well, uh, one thing I learned a long time ago is not to worry about uh, things that uh, you, know, you don't have to worry about. And basically, uh, the, uh, there are some th things like uh, existential quant you know, like quantification over tuples, which uh, is something that basically I don't know, what, you know for sure whether it should be removed or not. I use it seldom enough that, uh, and there's a, a subtle aspect of it as to what, exactly what it means. And in some sense, I mean, I have to go to uh, look at that, you know, appropriate section in uh, the specifying system book to, uh, to understand exactly what it means, because I hardly ever use it. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. And I haven't, there's occasionally something that, especially having to do with the proof language that I think might need to be added. Uh, I think that's the only place uh, that I would, I would expect people want, you know, that in the future, somebody might, uh, you know, people might want to, uh, to add something. Yeah, it's great that you, um that you mentioned the proof system. There's the, the next question by Ugur Yavuz, um, which is about the proof system. Um, is there any limitation to what type of properties one can prove correct using the proof system, the TLA plus proof system? Specifically, I'm aware that the modus operandi in proving algorithm invariance correct using TLA plus involves identifying inductive invariants that imply the said invariant. But will there, will there always be such an inductive invariant? Well, uh, that is the only way to prove uh, that uh, something is an invariant. Uh, and I mean, I've never heard of any other way of doing it. Uh, by the way, the um, what I'm hoping for is to be able to use model checking in order to help you find the induct variant. And uh, there's a note somewhere on the TLA website about uh, how, uh, an idea about checking inductive invariance using, you know, probabilistically, using uh, some uh, operators that uh, Marcus um, he implemented them all, and I think he thought of some of them. Uh, so, uh, but no, there, there's no royal road to uh, you know, find you know, proving invariance. And getting back to the first part of the question, what about the proof language itself? Are there, what are the uh, likely additions or changes um, in TLAPS in the proof language? Um, there are things that we've, you know, that we come across sometimes that instructions we want to give to the theorem prover. And so far, we've always been able to kludge them into the current syntax. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if that's always going to be the case. But I don't have any, any simple, uh, straightforward examples off the top of my head. 
Yeah, maybe if I may interject here personally, um, do you think the, the new support for proving liveness property is going to make uh, to require changes beyond the uh, new keywords? Uh, that's a possibility. Uh, I'm afraid I haven't had time to really play with the uh, with the new uh, you know, the new uh, backends for proving uh, op operations for proving uh, liveness properties. So. Uh, I don't have anything intelligent to say about it. Uh, perhaps when I've got a couple of things on my desk now that I get rid of, uh, you know, take care of them, maybe in a few months I'll be able to, to get to that. Um, yet again, another follow-up question. I guess this means that do you also plan to eventually write a, like a tutorial paper to how to, how to prove liveness, like you wrote with proving safety properties? Uh, I don't know. I have no immediate plans, and uh, you know, nobody is you know, banging on my inbox uh, to write one. <laughs> so we'll see. Okay. So then let's move on to the uh, next question by Aaron Brooks. So today, if I check a model and it takes X time, and check the identical model, and it would take X time again, right? So we remodel check, and then uh, if we recheck a model, we don't get anything from the first model. Right? It takes the same amount of time. I have an assumption, possibly wrong, that both the results of full modeling, a full model run, as well as parts of the run of a second, I guess, can be cached structurally and used to allow recomputation, trading compute time for storage. What's, what's your uh, thought on that? Well, if you know how to do it, uh, that sounds like an interesting uh, thing to try, but um, I don't know what one could cache uh, from uh, model checking. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe if, if I may answer this question or extend this, this answer of the question, I think what you can obviously do is you can cache the state graph, and then if you want to evaluate new properties, um, then you could do this on the same state graph again. Uh, I guess this depends really if it pays off or not of how complex your next state relation is. Uh, if it's super quick to evalu evaluate the next state relation, then probably you can just um, create the graph on the fly again. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I personally know probably about 10 approaches to make TLC fast in various areas. If there's interest and there's the manpower to get this done, please come and talk to me. Okay, are there more questions for Leslie? Andrea's question. If you were to add probability to TLA plus, how would you do it? <laughs> uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, for example, uh, specifying Markov decision processes. So you it, it kind of like merges uh, non-determinism with some probabilistic steps. And so you say you'd want to check what's the maximum or minimum probability of arriving in a certain state. Um, well, the problem is you have to you know, add probabilities to transitions and that, uh, um, you know, I don't know how to do that in a practical way. Uh, one thing that, you know, when you're looking that you should consider is what something that was done you know, around the 1970s, that what you do is you verify that your specification satisfies a Markov model. Uh, that is everything about the, you know, the transitions of the Markov model just uh, and then you add the probabilities to the Markov model and you use existing tools for figuring out the probabilities of, of you know, something happening. But uh, other than that, I don't have any you know, real ideas of how to make something in practice. Okay, more questions? Otherwise, I get to ask a question. No, I don't. <laughs> Lauren? 
Um, so my understanding is that prophecy variables were motivated by um, a problem in the Hurley and Wig and Wing paper on linearizability. There was an example that they had that you had to develop prophecy variables to handle that in TLA plus. But I couldn't find anyone who's actually used those to solve that particular, to prove that particular refinement. Do you know if anyone's actually used prophecy variables to, for that one specific example of, I think it was like a Q? Um, uh, well, I have, and I've, you know, I've got it sitting around somewhere. But, uh, the, uh, also, Stefan Mertz, well, I'm sure. I think Stefan Mertz has also uh, done that. Or actually, I'm not even sure if I did it or Stefan did it. Uh, I mean, we were going to, I think at some point we were going to do it, use that in the, uh, the paper we wrote on uh, prophecy variables, but uh, didn't. So somewhere there is a specification. It's, yeah. it's not terribly, well, yeah, it's, it's not terribly difficult. I mean, you, you know the, uh, the paper I'm talking about by Stefan and me? Was that a yeah. yes? Yeah, the, the prophecy variable paper? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know the paper. Okay, so yeah. uh, that, um, it, it's pretty straight, it, that gives the general idea of having an intermediate level specification and using, requiring prophecy to go from the intermediate level specification to the high level specification. Uh, and then it's straightforward to, the, to uh, prove the, uh, you know, to show the implementation that the, uh, their example satisfies the, the intermediate level. Um, the, I think probably what, well, I don't remember what I've done, but I don't, I, I don't think it's, it's not a terribly difficult uh, thing to do you know, once you understand prophecy, the you know, kind of prophecy variable. For those of us that are self-taught, what would you recommend in terms of like basic set math that, a book that I could read to get a little better handle on basic set math and stuff like this? Um, I don't know. I think it probably depends on how much work you want to do. Uh, Chris Newcomb liked the uh, Grease and Schneider book. Uh, not sure. I don't remember what the title is, but... Uh, on the other hand, you know, they have, they spend a lot of time on you know, writing proofs and uh, although nothing about that will, that will help you, well, uh, it seems to me that there should be some easier way to, uh, to learn those things. Um, but I don't know anything about textbooks, so I, I'll just repeat. You know, Chris's recommendation and say that uh, I'm skeptical <laughs> that's the best way. So has anybody ever found a use for um, temporal universal quantification? Temporal, well. I, mean, I, remember, I remember that was in the book as like, it's here if you, like, we're not sure what it's useful for, but like it's here just to complete the temporal existential quantification. I don't remember if, uh, you know, if I've ever, medication to use it, certainly not in anything that I'd be model checking. There may have been, I have this vague feeling that there are some properties that I once writ, have, have written at some point that, that uses them, but uh, nothing that an engineer would uh, ever want to look at and uh, nothing that, you know, I would ever want to uh, actually, you know, model check or run a theorem prover on. What's something that has happened somewhat recently in model checking that has particularly excited you? Uh, well, uh, not recent, uh, but the uh, advantages and uh, you know, in the improvements in our uh, prover to, uh, I'm sorry, did you say model checking? Yes, yes. Or, or, or theorem proving. Checking? I, I guess both. We can answer for both. Oh. Yeah. Model checking. Uh, 
Well, uh, I'm not excited yet because it's it's got some ways to go to, uh, but the uh, you know the Appalachia uh, prover, uh, model checker, you know that sounds like it could be a, a win. Uh, the thing that I'm you know, looking forward to, especially in theorem proving, is to see if, or possibly in writing specs, is to see if uh, machine learning can be useful for something. But, uh, you know, I don't follow model checking or theorem proving outside of, uh, you know, what goes on in, in TLA+. Plus. So, you know, there's a great big world I don't know about, and I'm trusting... Uh, my colleagues to uh, uh, f if something relevant to TLA plus pops up out there uh, to you know, see how we can make use of it but you know, I'm not keeping up on the, the latest advances maybe a follow up um, and what were the what were the um, one two three first applications of machine learning in terms of TLA plus tools you can think of? Uh, I can't think of any use of machine learning in TLA plus tools. Uh, do you, can you? <laughs> well, for example, in the proof system, uh, it could perhaps have it, um, AI built into it that recommends something like Pragmas, for example, better to select spec and provers by uh, yeah, pre-learning what are sensible choices. Yeah. Again, I don't understand enough about you know the innards of the uh, you know, TLAPS prover uh, to really know how you know how model how machine learning can be put to use. And I just hope it can. <laughs> this is clearly a, a powerful tool. Um, and then maybe what are the applications of machine learning and TLAPS outside of of the tools? Did you think of? I'm sorry, of machine learning not related and to the TLA plus? Not related oh, not to related the... not related to TL plus, you mean? No, not related to the tools of TLA plus. You mentioned machine learning earlier. Uh, that's what it's something you're excited about. So if you don't see TLA plus uh, sorry, machine learning relevant for the TLA plus tools, where do you see machine learning relevant for TLA plus as the language? Well, I think it's uh... I mean, it is so you know completely alien to TLA plus, and uh, you know there's this well, this basic problem with machine learning is how do you prove anything about uh, what it's going to do, and uh, so you know I don't know how you know what's going to happen in the future in terms of you know people writing programs with. Uh, uh, machine learning that they don't know what they actually do, and the people who build systems that they really want to make reliable, that uh, they need to understand what they do. So, uh, as, as the Danes say, uh, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> okay, do we have more questions here in the, in the room? Then I have one more question, a little bit more historical. Um, so when you created TLA Plus initially, were you thinking uh, in terms of industrial applications of TLA Plus or purely academical, like writing papers, advancing the field? What was your primary driver to creating TLA Plus? Oh, uh, yeah, getting it used in industry. Uh, the, uh, I've, I don't know how things are now, but back around uh, 1990 when uh, no, I had sort of, well, where I, when I had uh, developed TLA, uh, I had no, not I'm um, to be uh, rather uh, disenchanted with uh, academic uh, work in the area of uh, 
specification and verification. Um, and you know, my goal was to get it used by, uh, by engineers. So then perhaps we can end with your outlook, the next 10 years of TLA Plus, what do you think they will look like? Uh, well, uh, as I say, you know, predicting the future, predictions are difficult, especially about the future, and I don't, uh, I've been largely too busy with, uh, you know, TLA Plus of today. Uh, to think very much about the LA plus of the future, but there is some thinking about that that is going to be done soon. And uh, I don't know uh, if you want to say anything about it, Mark, at this point, Marcus, but I think it would be a little premature. Okay. We, I guess we tabled that topic for now. So, unless somebody has thought of another question, I would say we thank Leslie. No questions, I'm okay. Thank you.